unless it's possible to say that a drug was made by studying people like you, we can never truly reassure you that it's okay. And the only way to do that is for you to participate in a study. And so please help us to design our studies. Hi everyone, I'm Raif Darazi, and today I'm excited to have a conversation with our wonderful guest, Dr. Neka Nwakolo, to discuss her work on HIV and women, aging with HIV, increasing our understanding of what U equals U means, for example, why viral blips can still mean that you're untransmittable, and how clinical studies need to evolve to be more inclusive if HIV research is to have any hope of being representative of the communities it seeks to serve and to meet those needs. Dr. Neka Nwokolo is Head of Patient and Engagement at Vive Healthcare and an Honorary Consultant HIV Physician at Chelsea and Westminster Hospital in London. Her special interests include the sexual and reproductive health of women living and aging with HIV, particularly in raising awareness of the impact of menopause on HIV, as well as increasing the participation of women living with HIV in clinical trials. She is a passionate advocate of HIV treatment as prevention, test and treat, and pre-exposure prophylaxis, and is engaged in efforts to raise awareness of HIV in the general population, to spread the message of U equals U, and reduce the stigma associated with HIV. Now, before we continue, I do want to be explicitly clear, one of NECA's many roles, as I just mentioned, includes working for Vive Healthcare. They are a pharmaceutical company that creates medications for people living with HIV. I do, on occasion, work in paid partnerships with them. This conversation, however, is completely separate from that. I'm not receiving any kind of payment, services, or benefits for doing this. This is just a result of me wanting to hear from various experts with all kinds of backgrounds and share that with you. You guys can rest assured that anytime I am being paid or working in partnership with a company, I will make that explicitly clear from the beginning. With that said, Neka, thank you so much for agreeing to come on. And thank you so much for inviting me. I've really been looking forward to this conversation. Yeah, it's a long overdue. Um, we met at the AIDS 2022 conference in Montreal, where I got to host some um, live panel discussions, and I just lo particularly loved your energy. When I got home, my mom um, also made it a point to say, because she was watching from home, how much she loved you and the things that you said in particular. Oh, that's and, really good to say. Yeah, and for that reason, you were definitely someone I wanted to follow up with, and you have such a warm and reassuring energy about you, so I have no doubt that you know your message will really resonate with my audience. I hope so. Thank you. Well, I'll start with a general question. What is your assessment of the current state of the global HIV AIDS epidemic? Oh, that's a, <laughs> that's a good question to begin with. No, and it, I, I think it's an important one. I think it depends very much where you are. I think, but I think overall, it's, it's in a good place, but it still has quite a long way to go. So I think the majority of countries in the world have access to good antiretroviral therapy and many, many, many people who are on treatment worldwide uh, are on successful treatment and have an undetectable viral load. But there are still places in the world where access to HIV treatment is, um, is difficult because of stigma, for example, um, because of discrimination, because of criminalization of HIV and people who live in those countries uh, will find it difficult to come forward for treatment for fear that they will be, um, you know, that the authorities will be made aware of them and, and they could be persecuted or prosecuted. So that's something that isn't, isn't good. And also, if you look at the trajectory, the UN AIDS trajectory and target for ending uh, HIV as a global pandemic by 2030, we are very far away from, from that. And so although the numbers of new infections are going down, the numbers of people dying of HIV have gone down tremendously, we're still seeing new infections in different groups of people. And until we stop seeing new infections, I think there's really, you know, it, it'll be a while before we end uh, HIV um, as a global epidemic. And I don't think we'll do it by 2030. Well, well, thank you for that very um, real response and your assessment on that. Um, yeah, it's, it's really is a shame that we, we really do have all the tools necessary to end the a HIV epidemic today, yesterday, really. Um, but that it's things like access and, and stigma and politicization and geopolitical events that are really hampering that effort. All right. So th there's a lot to cover. I'm really excited to 
dive into some really interesting um, topics here. Before we do that, I would love to get a little bit of background on who you are as a human being behind all the amazing things that you're doing. Can you tell me where you are originally from, where you grew up? So I am originally from two places. My mother is uh, from the Caribbean, from Barbados, and my father was from Nigeria. Uh, I grew up in Papua New Guinea, which is an island just north of Australia. Um, and we lived in Australia for some time, and I lived in Nigeria for a while. And I came to the UK in 1993. Oh, wow, that's fascinating. Can you explain how that transition happened or what the reasoning behind that was? Sure. So um, six months after I was born, my parents, who were in Nigeria at the time, uh, took me to Australia uh, because my father had a, a scholarship to do a PhD at Melbourne University. And so I, we moved to Australia when I was six months old and we lived there till I was about six. Uh, my siblings were born there. And then uh, we moved to Papua New Guinea because my father had a job uh, teaching at the University of Papua New Guinea. And we lived there till I was about 13. And then I went to Nigeria to go to boarding school. And I started medical school in Nigeria. And then I went back to Papua New Guinea. The story of my life. <laughs> <laughs> and what, uh, what did your father study? What was his expertise? Law. Law. Okay. He was a law. And so what piqued your interest to get into the, the field of medicine that you're focused on? Um, so living in Papua New Guinea and going to medical school in Papua New Guinea, um, sort of the bulk of um, diseases that we saw uh, and the bulk of sort of medicine that we saw was infectious diseases. So I was really, really interested in infectious diseases. And when I moved um, to the UK after doing a, a, a research job, uh, in Papua New Guinea, I thought that that would be my career, that I would do infectious diseases. And then I kind of found out more. And at that point, I didn't know very much about HIV. HIV was still quite new. Um, there weren't really effective treatments. But I started kind of understanding more about HIV, and I was really fascinated by it. And the other thing also is that I'm really interested in people. And HIV is a condition that really you know, it, it, it's not just about HIV, the medical condition. It's about the lives of people. It's about how they interact with society. It's about how society interacts with them. It's about how we as human beings treat other human beings. And, and sometimes I think we, we fail in that. And HIV, I think, is a manifestation of sometimes how we do badly with regard to our relationships with, with other people. And I was kind of fascinated both by HIV as a medical condition, but also by the responses that HIV creates in people, both good and bad. And so, you know, after a little while, I thought, well, this is something that I'd like to study more about. And so I, I specialized and uh, became a consultant physician. And yeah, and that's been my life. And how did you get involved with Vive Healthcare? Why Vive? Uh, yeah, so because, I mean, so, you know, Vive is a, is a company that is exclusively dedicated to, to HIV. It doesn't uh, treat any other uh, medical conditions. It doesn't make any other medicines. It just makes uh, HIV uh, medicines for HIV treatment and prevention. And I'd worked in the National Health Service in the UK for many, many years, for over 20 years. And I think sometimes when you're when you've done the same job for a, a long, long time, even if you love it, I think you do sometimes think, is there anything else I could do? And I have a, a great cu curiosity for for just doing other things. But I wanted to stay in the field of HIV. Um, and I, I know a lot of people at Vive, and I knew a lot of people when I was working in the, in the health service, and everyone talked about what a great company it was to, you know, it is to work in. And um, a couple of friends convinced me when I was sort of thinking about what I wanted to do next, uh, to come to Vive, and I was fortunate, fortunate enough to uh, have been offered a job, and here I am. But I'm also lucky enough to be able to continue my HIV clinic. And so I still do a clinic in London as well as working at Vive. Yeah, I noticed that you um, and then you co-founded a company as well. How how do you find time to do all these things? Oh, uh, yeah, I'm, I, I, I'm learning how to manage my time. Um, so the company that I founded is, uh, is it's for women. It's a, it's a menopause, um, an online menopause clinic. And um, as you said in my introduction, I'm really, really interested in, um, in women aging, both with HIV and without HIV. And so um, unfortunately, menopause care, I think regardless of whether it's in HIV or just generally, is not very good. And there are lots of complicated reasons uh, for that, that we probably don't have time to go 
into. But I really wanted to set up um, a service that women could could come to to talk about their experience of menopause to access treatment if they want to and just to understand uh, menopause better. So that's what that is. Um, and my HIV clinic, I do sort of a general HIV clinic, but also an HIV menopause clinic, because we, we know from research that women living with HIV may experience menopause somewhat differently from women in the general population. So there are some uh, data to suggest that women living with HIV uh, start menopause earlier than women without HIV, um, that women with HIV may have more severe menopause symptoms than women without HIV. And one thing that we know about menopause is that before menopause, women are protected from lots of chronic diseases, from heart disease, from diabetes, from Alzheimer's disease. And then after menopause, because estrogen levels have gone down, so estrogen protects them, those uh, conditions go, go, go up, the risk of those conditions go up. And that's even more so the case in women living with HIV, because people with HIV in general, even if their HIV is controlled, do have a slightly higher risk of things like heart disease, for example. Um, and so there is a sort of baseline higher risk of heart disease in people living with HIV overall, but menopause increases that risk further. And so I, I'm really interested in kind of supporting women with HIV to get really good health care, to understand the implications of menopause, and also to try to do things, do what they can to prevent um, the sort of long term consequences of menopause. Yeah, you, you I mean, you pretty much ans answered it, the, the considerations for women versus men or treating the population is just like one entity. What what sorts of changes do you find need to be implemented to address these uh, considerations? You mean for both men and women or women well, generally? For women specifically. Mm -hmm. So I think the first thing we need to understand and be clear about is that biologically there are a lot of differences between women and men, but mostly because in most um, sort of high income countries, the majority of people living with HIV generally tend to be um, men who have sex with men. Um, most of the studies that, that are done are done in men who have sex with men. The treatment studies are done in men. And so you get we have a lot of data in men. And some of those data you can apply to women, but a lot of them you potentially can't. And so when you're doing studies of men and then you want to treat women, what we're not clear about very often is, so do these drugs work the same way in women? Are there particular side effects that these drugs may have in women that we, we don't know about because we didn't have enough women in the studies? There are particular concerns about um, antiretroviral treatment studies in, in pregnant women because everyone's scared to do studies in pregnancy because they're worried about um, the health of the unborn baby, which is a really important issue. But the trouble is then, because no one's done studies in pregnant women, we give these pregnant women treatments that have never been studied in pregnancy. So we can't actually say to a woman when we give her treatment, this is safe. So it's better to carefully study these drugs in pregnancy so that you can identify whether there are any problems. And then you can say, OK, actually, we think that there may be a signal that there's a problem here. We need to be careful, as opposed to saying, you know, you start someone on treatment and a woman says to you, so have these drugs been studied in pregnancy? And you go, uh, no, sorry. And then she's like, well, then how can you reassure me that they're safe? So that's something we have to think about really carefully. And wasn't that the case with PrEP too, that for a long time, it just wasn't studied in women. And so it, it could only be recommended for men. That's right. That, that's right. Some c certain kinds of PrEP. And so that's why it's really, okay. really important. And I think we also need to encourage women to... Um, be aware of the fact that it's important that they participate in studies. So if they hear about a study that's going on to say, actually, I'd really like to be in a study. Because one thing that um, doctors very often do is they think, oh, it's too hard to recruit women to studies because, oh, they don't want to be in studies or we have to think about childcare or we have to, you know, just go out of our way to recruit women to studies. And my answer to that is, if women need, if, if you need to provide childcare for women to participate in studies, then provide the childcare, because, because because you will get a much better quality of study. You will you will be able to recruit the same people who you hope will take your treatments to the studies, so you'll be able to have a better idea of how these medicines work. You know, th this idea that it's too hard to recruit women to studies is is just terrible. And when you ask women if they want to be in studies, when I've asked my patients, they will say yes. So we need to do better. Yeah, I agree. And 
if if clinical research was structured based on what was the easiest to most convenient way to study things, wouldn't there be an inherent bias there, just like we're seeing now with men? Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. So you only get a certain group of people who participate in your studies who do not at all reflect um, <laughs> the, the people who eventually will will um, take advantage of those treatments. That's absolutely right, Ray. Yeah, I've recently been um, heavily involved in an NIH, NIH funded uh, Martin Delaney collaboratories here in the U.S., where um, community members are on a community advisory board, and we're meeting with scientists and researchers in HIV cure research. And it's such a common theme in HIV cure research is that, um, you know, in, invariably a member of the community will raise their hand or speak up at a, at a conference or at a meeting and go, who, who, who are the participants in this in study? How many, how many women are there? Um, what different ethnicities are involved? And, and time after time after time after time, the most often what happens is the investigator says, you know, it's such a, we have such a small pool of people in this particular study, um, they're, they're all unfortunately men. They're all they're all white, um, and yeah, we need to do better in the future. And and I don't really know how that you know evolves into something. How, like I'm just I'm just like kind of stumped as to how maybe someone in the community can help push for that. But you didn't you did make a good suggestion, which is that women can be more proactive in seeking out clinical trials and wanting to be more involved. I can also maybe say something of what I'm doing at Vive Healthcare. And I think you were going to ask a question because that speaks to exactly what you have just raised, actually. So apart from my job working um, in the hospital, at Vive, I'm the head of patient engagement. And one of the most important parts of my job, or one of the things that I've made really, really a, a crucial part of my job, is thinking about how we engage patients and community in the development of our studies in clinical studies. And so because of this very thing that you have, have talked about, the fact that it's really a tiny, tiny group of mainly white sort of early middle aged men who part of, a, you know, who of a certain socioeconomic demographic who participate in clinical trials. So one thing that we're trying to set up um, at Vive in, in the patient engagement team is a, a sort of global patient council, I suppose you might say. Or, pay, or steering a committee, who we're going to ask for sort of input into our trials, but also many of them will be people who belong to um, patient uh, advocacy groups and so on, who have uh, very strong links with different communities. And where we will be asking those people to please go out into their communities to talk to people about why it's important for people to be in clinical trials, to reassure people who are worried about being in clinical trials, because we know that some people are frightened of being in studies because of the history of things that have happened sometimes in studies and the feeling that um, they, they're, they're being experimented on. So to try to be really honest and open about what happens in studies, give people the opportunity to answer questions, but really stress to them that unless you, unless it's possible to say that a drug was made by studying people like you, we can never truly reassure you that it's okay. And the only way to do that is for you to participate in a study. And so please help us to design our studies. And we want to do this over a really wide range of people. We want to get young people. We want to get um, older people. We want to get women. We want to get men. We want to get trans and, and non-binary people. We want to get people from different ethnicities. We, we want to try to get as many, get as much representation from all the people who we hope will um, be able to take our medicines in the future. And and I think it's not an impossible task. I think it is possible, but I think we just have to know how to approach the right people. And we would call on you, people who are really active in the community, Rafe, to help with that, if you're willing to. Absolutely. And this is in part why I've set up this channel and why I'm doing what I'm doing. Um, there is a lot of fear. And while we're on this topic, there's a lot of distrust, <clears throat> especially between community and science and research and healthcare and, and medicine, as we've seen throughout the, <clears throat> excuse me, as, as we've seen during the COVID pandemic, as well as um, just the rollout of PrEP even was challenging and still is challenging to this day. And I saw an article recently about black women in the South in the US 
are really struggling to even get a prescription for PrEP and their healthcare providers don't even want to give it because they're lacking the education um, to know that that's something that they should have access to. So I think having these types of conversations, education is key. You know, a lot of these things to me are very, I think, basic, intuitive, and fundamental across the board, but for some reason are just not um, employed the way they should be. I think it's, to me, it's obvious that education is key and that when people are informed, like they make better decisions and they, they feel more control over their lives. They have less fear. So educating and then being transparent, kind of lifting the veil because um, science and research can be so heady and dense and inaccessible to the community. And that creates this wall of secrecy. It feels like, so if we can begin to break down these difficult concepts and terms and, and just take the time to sit down and say, here, let's, let's explain this as we're on the journey, not at the end when we're trying to push something in your face, then when these things do become available, um, I would think that community members will be more readily accepting of, of them. I agree with you. I agree with you fully. Yeah. So, um, and then so you mentioned earlier also stigma is a, a big issue for ending the HIV epidemic. Um, part of what's been able to help dissolve stigma to an extent is the messaging of U equals U or undetectable equals untransmittable. Would you speak to what the WHO recently announced um, regarding zero risk in relation to U mm. equals U? Yeah. I mean, to me, that is hugely, hugely exciting. And so we've known about U equals U, for, uh, we've known about U equals U really since about 2008, when the Swiss um, uh, published data about their cohort of patients who they've been following for a long time, showing that none of the people in their cohort who had an undetectable viral load, the partners of, of none of the people who had, had an undetectable viral load had acquired HIV. And it's really weird because um, because we didn't know what the mechanism was. A lot of scientists were like, mm, can't be true. Uh, we're not going to support that. But as time went on, uh, and, and the thing is, we, we knew all of us had patients who were in a relationship with somebody who was negative, And they would say, yeah, yeah, we use condoms all the time. But sometimes they'd let it slip that they didn't use condoms all, all the time. And their negative partners would come and test every year, whatever, and they'd be negative. And so we kind of knew that there was something. And the thing is that our patients knew it long before we did. They knew. And then they, they um, from about 2015, studies looking at this specifically, the partner study, um, the partner's prep study, um, opposites attract, all of those studies showed really clearly that if you had an undetectable viral load, there was no risk of transmission to your partner. And... So now it was scientific fact. With the Swiss cohort, it was like, okay, this is an observation. But this was like a randomized controlled trials with, you know, altogether thousands of people and no transmissions. And so although lots of HIV societies knew this, endorsed this, lots of HIV clinicians talked to their patients about it, WHO never really endorsed it until this year. And then this year it did. And I think it's been really helpful that WHO has done this because a lot of the organizations that have endorsed it in the past have been organizations linked to high income countries. So Europe, the United States and so on. But WHO really represents the global HIV epidemic and includes lots of countries that are low and middle income uh, and, and uh, who look to WHO for guidelines rather than to the CDC or or other um, sort of Western uh, guideline bodies. And so WHO has been really clear that if you have an undetectable viral load, there is no risk of transmission. And that actually, it doesn't matter what test you do, because there's been a worry that uh, U equals U only applies to places where you can do a blood test with plasma, and that it only applies to a viral load of less than 50. But it's really clear WHO has done lots of research to look at the different ways that you can test, from HIV, test for HIV, including a dried blood spot where they get a filter paper and you, you have a finger prick and then um, you put a spot of blood on the, on the filter paper and then it can be analysed in the lab. And where the viral load is less than 200, that is basically equivalent to an undetectable viral load. And so as long as the test is done by what's what's called a WHO pre-qualified test, so a test that WHO endorses as being 
a reliable test, wherever you are in the world, if you have access to a test like that and it comes back saying that you have an undetectable viral load, you have an undetectable viral load. And that is incredible. Absolutely. And, you know, um, I know that some of the concerns that I've heard over time is the idea of having um, viral blips, which is when periodically or unknown necessarily necessarily unknown reasons um your viral load might come back and, and it might have spiked out, outside of so we might so for some someone like me i'm used to having like less than 20 milliliters per copy i don't even know what the exact number i just know it's less than that and that's that's as much as the test can detect <clears throat> and say uh, this has happened to me only one time since 2012 since i was diagnosed where i came back and my viral load was um between that less than 20 and, and 100. So, and that's oftentimes that's what happens is that you'll have a blip like that. And there was this concern for the longest time that, oh, if I have a blip, oh my gosh, that means I'm at high risk. I, I could transmit it. And that was also the argument for people who were um, not living with HIV that are concerned. They're like, well, even if you're adherent, you could have these viral blips and then you're putting people at risk. So shame on you. And therefore, I'm justifying criminalization laws and what have you. It just goes down the rabbit hole. But this is was so, to me, impactful because they're saying less than 200 milliliters is undetectable. So there's a huge range where you could potentially have a blip and still be undetectable and still fall under the guidelines that you cannot transmit. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And so, and, and I think this is a really important point to, to make. So even people who are absolutely completely adherent. They take their treatment always at the same time, every day. And we know that actually now with modern treatment, you don't have to be, you have to be adherent, but you don't have to take it exactly at one o'clock on the dot. As long as you take it every day, that's adherent enough. Even if people are like that, they still get blips. And so what's not clear is, are those blips real virus? Or is it just something to do with the test? Or is it just dead virus? Because these tests are really, really sensitive. So I think the first time a person has a blip, it's sometimes not clear whether that's because they missed taking a tablet or they were taking something that might interfere with their antiretrovirals. But if the test is repeated and it's gone back to being undetectable and the person was taking their treatment, um, you know, as prescribed, then, it, then it's likely that that was a blip. And if it was less than 200, it's not going to be, you know, associated with any risk of transmission. But we, in general, depending on the level of the blip, we would want to just repeat it just in case somebody might have been struggling with their treatment or something. And so if, if you see that it's, it's, it's detectable and then you repeat it, you know, a few weeks or a few months later and it's still detectable and, and it's going up, then that's more than a blip. And then you need to kind of think about, well, what's going on? But under normal circumstances, we don't understand what those blips are when, when a person is completely adherent. So, First of all, thank you for saying that uh, with modern treatment, it's not crucially important to take your medicine at the exact hour, minute, second of every single day, because I think that if I could get that message across to some of my viewers, I so I created this Telegram group where folks can go and, and there's over a thousand people on there and there's different rooms with different subjects. They can talk about romance and dating and medication, stuff like that. And there's huge, there's a huge amount of anxiety um, over taking the medication at the same time. And it's like, oh my gosh, what if I miss it by an hour? Or uh, it's not working for me at night. I want to take it in the morning. How do I make that transition? Do I need to do like 15 minute increments over the course of six weeks? And and there's just a lot of anxiety around that. So I think it's really important to get that message across that when you've been undetectable, you've been on successful treatment for a certain amount of time and you're on really good medication that it's it's not going to make or break your your health outcome. Yeah, no, it's and that, that's a burden for so many people. And with earlier treatments that weren't so good, um, I think maybe there was an, a need to, you know, to take it as, as, as much on time as you could. Um, but that, I think, has stayed with people just because we always made people like, you must not forget, you must not forget, you must not forget. And people mustn't forget. And you must get into the habit um, of taking it every day. But but we now know that it's not, you don't have to be rigid about it, that as long as you, you take it every day, live your life and don't be worried. I mean, sometimes taking it at the same time every day is good for some people because it's a reminder. It's a routine. And if you, if, yeah, exactly, because it's a routine. So if you start to take it at different times, then there's a, a risk that you might forget. But for most people, you know, an hour 
two hours, three, as long as you take it every day, you take it 10 o'clock in the morning, as long as you take it by 10 o'clock in the evening, it's, you know, I think, yeah, this yeah, it shouldn't be a burden. Yeah, I, th I think it speaks to a, a type of messaging in a way that um, healthcare providers can, can speak to people living with HIV that can be more helpful. I think I, I have a feeling <clears throat> that certain healthcare providers may err on the side of hyper caution, of hyper rigidity, like you're saying, um, because that in their minds is better to impress upon the patient than um, a kind of a lackadaisical approach, or therefore might make, opens up the possibility of being too casual about things and forgetting and not taking it as seriously. But I think there's this space in between that's a little bit more nuanced where you have this kind of what you, exactly how you described it, a more nuanced conversation. Yes, it's very important. However, these are the facts. You have some room. Don't, you know, overstress. That is the type of approach that I think moving forward is going to be more beneficial to our community and it's going to help create that trust. Because when we find out, oh, I don't need to take it every hour at the exact hour every single day and and then you find out other little pieces that were like your doctor told you something very specific but it's not quite like that i didn't get the full picture it like like oh do i have to question everything my doctor says or they're not giving me the full story and i remember distinctly feeling that way at times too mm -hmm. yeah yeah i mean i think we just have to be honest and our patients are the people who know themselves the best and you know so you have a conversation do you think that if you um didn't take your pills always at the same time that you might forget and then they say yeah I think so so maybe I'll try but then I would say but you know as long as you take it within a couple of hours of that time then you're fine don't you don't have to be take it on the dot and then other people who say no nah, I, I, I will remember to take it I, I'm good I, I yeah as, then then that's that's good for them too I think we have to to figure out what's right for each individual person because everyone's different totally and and trusting that when you inform them that they will make better choices like like we mentioned in, in the beginning okay beat that over the head with a hammer um <laughs> okay um kind of wrapping up with u equals u and being undetectable i i saw a, a tweet that you put out recently when you were at um, eacs 2023 um, in which there were some concerning findings about the doral study i'm not too familiar with the study itself but you mentioned that there was a participant who had an undetectable plasma viral load, which is what we were talking about, and yet had a detectable semen viral load. And you were really concerned um, about what kind of information was communicated to the participant regarding those findings. Can you speak to that? And, and, and if there's any concern there or if there's not and why? Sure, thank you for that question. So, and this speaks to what we've just been talking about, about the fact that if you have an undetectable viral load and viral loads are measured in the plasma. We don't routinely measure viral loads in the genital secretion, so neither in the semen nor in the vaginal secretions. So the basis for U equals U is based on plasma. So if you have an undetectable viral load in your blood, in your plasma, you cannot transmit HIV to your sexual partners. So the Dordal study is a study of medicines. And one of the things they did in that study was to see whether the combination of medicines that they were using, uh, whether they stopped um, shedding of a uh, virus in the semen. And so they studied a, a whole lot of people, they took a whole lot of people who had an undetectable viral load and they measured the virus in their semen. And I think two people uh, had virus in their semen, who, even though they had an undetectable viral load in their plasma. Um, one of them, I think, they repeated the test and then uh, it was undetectable in the semen again. And in one of them, the other one, I think they found it once and then he was he wasn't followed he couldn't he didn't come back for follow-up so he was kind of somewhere in the community and my worry about him was we know very well that because he had an undetectable viral load in the plasma there was no risk of transmission to any partners that he might have and I was worried that they may have said oh well we found virus in your semen and not explained but actually it doesn't matter because the virus, because this is the thing is that the virus that you find in in semen, a lot of studies have shown that actually this is defective virus. It's not virus that's capable of transmitting. So it doesn't matter that it's there. It's not. It, it's just there, dead virus, uh, bits of virus that have been discarded and so on. So I, I was just hoping that nobody had said, 
you have virus in your semen and then let him go off to figure it out for himself. I'm just hoping that he was told that doesn't matter. Um, we don't know what that virus in your semen means, but we know that what matters is that your virus in your plasma is undetectable. So you, there is no risk of you transmitting HIV to your partner. And so I think we have to be really careful what we say to people when we're doing studies. You know, nobody has to participate in clinical trials. They do so out of their, out of goodwill and wanting to help and wanting to do something for science. So I think it's really important that we don't do, we don't repay this with a disservice that makes them feel bad or, or makes them question the fact that they've done this um, or, or leaves them with questions that they don't have the answers to. And so that was why I made that comment. Yeah, and I'm glad you did. And not just the impact that it could have on the participant, but even just having it in a, the um, the research paper and not necessarily clarifying what that might imply or not imply for someone like me, who is weekly, you know, aggregating um, HIV news and covering, you know, the latest clinical studies. I, I what would my takeaway be or someone else who's who's doing this type of work? So I think it's important to be very clear about those things as well. Uh, I'm glad that you mentioned that about the d defective virus. I, I understand that that is also what contributes to those of us who are living with HIV and aging with HIV, like you mentioned, to higher risk factors, comorbidities, because although it's not um, an active virus that's doing its thing, it, it does have uh, an impact on our body in different ways that we're still learning more about, including chronic inflammation and how that contributes to risk factors. That's right. Yeah. Um, and that's why, you know, what I was talking about in the beginning, that even though people are on treatment and their viruses are suppressed, that when you compare people living with HIV who are on treatment with people of the same characteristics in the general population, we do see that there is a, a, a slight increase of, uh, in, in comorbidities, things like heart disease and so on. And some of that is mm -hmm. because of this immune response to virus that is still hanging around in whatever form. And, and so, you know, research is ongoing to look at what you can do about that and how you can try to suppress those immune responses that we know can cause harm. On an intellectual level, super fascinating work. I'm so, I just love learning about all this stuff. I love the science of it and kind of following that journey um, on an emotional, kind of personal, um, health related level. I think it's important that we're also having this discussion with people as well. So I'm trying to cover this more on my channel, aging and, and comorbidities, um, not to scare anyone. That's absolutely not the, the goal. It's quite the opposite. Um, like I said, as we educate, we empower people and, and these conversations are meant to help people feel empowered so that they're aware of what's happening in their body and happening in their environment and they can kind of make decisions and take control back of their lives and not feel like um, victims to yes. yeah. a virus. Yeah. And can I just say something on that point? Because I, you, you've really reminded me of something that's really important. I think it's really important to remember that for people living with HIV, that HIV is just one tiny part of their life. And as you go through life, there are so many things that come into your life that create inf the same inflammation that, that affect you. So, you know, so you might be on treatment successfully, undetectable viral load, but if you smoke, the impact of smoking on your immune system, on your overall health is way, way, way higher than the impact of that residual defective virus that is stimulating your immune system. If you don't exercise, th those impacts are, are way greater. If you eat highly processed, you know, fast food all the time, those things are much more important than uh, the residual virus that's that's multiplying. So it's really important to 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 you know be on treatment, take your treatment properly to keep your virus suppressed. But it's also important to think about your wider existence. Do you sleep? Because we know that people who don't sleep well are more likely to develop chronic disease than people who do. So thinking about ways to sleep, to sleep well, to be healthy, to uh, de-stress, all of those things. To me, actually, those are the things we we should be focusing on. Um, because they're the things we can make a, make a difference about. You know, if you're overweight, doing things to, to lose weight, much more important than being worried about the little amount of virus that is multiplying there. And because I think those things drive your immune system much more than, um, than the virus. Totally. We're over, overweighting um, the HIV virus and it's underweighting all these other things in our lives that have such a bigger impact. I, yeah. 
a few months ago, I was at the Buck Institute and they, they focused their research on aging. Uh, Eric Verdon is the director there and I got to interview him as well. And he was stressing that the majority of what impacts our health as we age, especially, even when we're talking about gene expression, is impacted by behavior. It's not, we're not born with our genes rigid, set in stone, and that's it. They can switch on and off depending on, on behaviors like sleep and anxiety and, and diet and exercise and all those things. So, and there's not, <clears throat> the other thing that I want to press upon people is that there's not some secret formula of how to live healthfully if you have HIV versus if you don't. Yeah. I'm always telling people it's the same. It's the same stuff that you hear all the time. Exactly the same. Exactly the same. Yeah. So it's funny because, you know, um, there's a, a lot of research that's looking into intermittent fasting at the moment and the impact of that on, um, you know, on well-being generally. And there, you know, there are some data to, to suggest that it's a helpful thing. But I had a patient in clinic today who said, am I allowed to fast if I'm positive? And I'm like, yes, you can fast. But there's no reason. If you want to, you can. Uh, and she was like, oh, because I didn't know I could. But you can do anything if you're living with HIV uh, that you can do if you're not living with HIV. Absolutely anything. Those th Some things might not be good things to do, but you can still, you can do them if you choose to do them. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm always saying you have to, on some levels, advocate for yourself as well when you're speak Because you want to you have this conversation with a healthcare professional, like for myself, when I wanted to do competitive bodybuilding. Um, my doctor said, yeah, of course you can. Well, I, I spoke to him about my supplements that I wanted to take. And, and, and then it's at that point, it's like, you're going on a journey with your healthcare provider to help you monitor. I mean, you're going there already, whether it's every two months, three months, six months, what have you to do your lab work. So what a great, I mean, it's so great that we have that at our disposal to monitor our health. So if we decide to make lifestyle changes or adjustments, like you can time that with when you're going to the doctor and say, okay, I want to take whey protein. I have no idea whether it'll be okay on my body or not. My doctor thinks it's fine. So let's start a month before, and this is just an example. I'm not giving advice. This is just something that I would do. I'm going to, a month before I go to my, to get my lab work done, I'm going to start taking protein on a regular basis. And then my doctor and I can review my lab, say, oh, okay, it looks fine. Okay, well, let's continue it. And then we'll check it again later. It's it's kind of, it, you have to be engaged with your with your health in that way. Okay, well, as we begin to wrap up here, time flies by. <laughs> and I would, I really would love to, because you mentioned we might not have time today to really dig into women's health and menopause. And by the way, I saw the word andropause when I was looking at some of your, and I was like, what's andropause? So I just, oh, that's, this is a whole study of men as well and their hormonal changes when, as they age. So that's fascinating as well. But I would love to maybe dedicate a chat with you specifically on women's health and as it relates to menopause and HIV. Yeah, I'd love to. Good. Really love to. Thank you. So as I've stated, the overarching point of my channel, aside from the obvious education and providing visibility for our community and hopefully some inspiration, is to be able to empower the community to have ownership over their own lives, no matter the circumstances, not just HIV, but everybody. And so... What message, if any, is there that you would like to share with the community to help them, aside from the myriad of ways you are helping them already, to feel more and to be more self-empowered? I think the one thing that I would say is don't be afraid to ask questions. There is no, no question that you could ask that is stupid or silly or not worth asking. Ask. And you have a right to ask and a right to be answered. And if you ask a question of somebody and it's not answered in the right way, then I, I know it's hard sometimes. If you can, then just say, sorry, you didn't answer my question. Can you please answer my question? And if you feel that that's difficult, then find someone. Many of us will have friends who are much more sort of um, proactive than we are. Go with a friend or ask your friend to ask the question. But you have a right not to be ignorant. You have a right to, to understand and to be educated and to know as much as you need to about yourself, about HIV, about the things going on around you. So please, please, please ask. And I would love to add to that. If you do ask and you do choose to inquire more and this person is not unwilling to kind of meet you where you're at and meet your needs, then consider finding someone else. You know, 
that person doesn't have to be the end all be all. Of course, some people don't have ac- don't have the luxury of a diversity of options. But if you do, you know, don't feel like you're beholden to one healthcare provider or one doctor, what have you. Hundred percent agree. In the coming year, twenty twenty four, what are you most looking forward to? It can be personally, it can be professionally, and uh, what goals or aspirations do you have? I think professionally to just continuing to spread this message of you equals you. And I really, I really, really am interested in understanding why people who don't believe in it don't believe in it and, and trying to address that. Because I think that we in the HIV world live in a bit of a bubble because we all believe it and we think that everybody around us believes it. And then you ask someone who's kind of not in your circle a question about it or you talk, and then you realise it's like, oh, actually, there are some people who don't believe it. And it's just like, oh, okay. So we, so what I want us to do is to try and burst this bubble, um, and and go out of this bubble and out into the world and talk to people about you equals you and address their worries about it and answer their questions. So many of your responses get me so hyped. Like I just want to get on my soapbox and start and start preaching because you're so right. Oh my gosh, I couldn't agree with you more. And um, I think what we're doing here. And I, I haven't really explained that in, in today's chat, but what you're talking about, the U equals U messaging, absolutely crucial. It's vital. It's so important. Um, I kind of look at it as a lot of this messaging that we're putting out is HIV 101. It's, it's, it's super basic. It's fundamental. It's vital, critical. Then um, on the other side of that spectrum, we have uh, science, research, clinical studies, papers and journals that are super dense, super heady. It's almost like speaking a completely different language that most people don't even have access to. So in having these conversations, my goal is to bridge that gap and fill in the space in between. There is a vast amount of people who are hungry to learn more, to kind of graduate from HIV 101 and begin to start picking up pieces of different little things here and understanding the science more. And like, like you were talking about viral remnants that are in our, in our body and starting to understand those things. Because I think when people have a basic understanding of virus and then they hear, Oh, it's um, you equals you. And yeah, there might be some virus, but it's, don't worry about it. It's not going to impact you. And that's, that's the extent of their knowledge. It's like, I can understand why someone would be skeptical when they hear that. Cause it doesn't, the math doesn't play out in their head. But if we can continue to educate a little bit more and kind of challenge people, I think give them more credit as far as what they're able to understand, then um, I think we're going to find more success there. So I appreciate the work that you're doing and the willingness to come on and explain these concepts in a fairly understandable way. Thank you. And and I really, I believe that it's our duty to, to, to make these things understandable. And I don't always do a good job of it, but I'm trying and I'm learning and and, and I need help, you know, from people like you who can communicate these messages. So I think we really need to work together to because I don't I don't believe that knowledge should be just, you know, only certain people should have knowledge. Everyone should have knowledge. And we have a duty to make make knowledge easily accessible to everyone and easily understandable to everybody. I, I really I hate this idea that knowledge is special <laughs> for special people. <laughs> everyone is special 100 percent. okay is there anything that we haven't touched on or discussed today that you'd like to mention before we close out i think we've discussed a lot we have Um, we've covered it quite a bit no i think i'm good i think unless you can think of anything no i think we've covered a lot nothing that won't take us down a rabbit hole okay well and 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 i want to give the proper space and time for that i think it would be unfair so i'm looking forward to our follow-up in other words. Me too. Me too. Okay. Thank you. And where can people go who are just in awe of, of you and your energy today, as I'm sure there are, go to follow you and or your work? Well, I'm I'm a bit rubbish, I have to say. Um, probably, the, I so Twitter. Um, so I'm, my, I think my Twitter handle is Dr. Nick and Wakola. Um, for menopause, um, uh, we, I have an Instagram called Shades of Menopause that I do with a colleague of mine which is kind of about menopause, mainly for women of color. And then the Instagram site for our, um, for the business that I run, uh, which has quite a lot of, a lot of educational stuff um, is called new woman health. So those three places. 
Okay. And so there's a website too. Is it new women? Mm, new women health health? Health. Dot co dot uk. Yeah. Okay, I'll be sure to include all of those links in the description box below once this video is live. Thank you. Everyone at home, please comment below your thoughts, comments, questions. I'm happy to follow up with NECA after the fact. NECA, a huge thank you to you for being so gracious with your time and your energy and your expertise. Everyone at home, thank you so much for watching. Be sure to like, subscribe, hit that bell so you get a notification every time a new video comes out. And please share this with anyone who might find value in this content. These are the best ways that you can help support me and my channel. Until next time, cheers. Thank you very much. Take care. Take care. Thank you. Say hi to your mom. Just